Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Jay Guidemore. I'm a member of the Executive Board of the Manuscript Society, and we are in for a treat tonight on Veterans Day. To all the veterans out there, thank you for your service. Um, Stuart Lutz is going to be talking about the American War in Vietnam, as shown through manuscripts. Um, the Manuscript Society has been doing Manuscript Mondays now for a few years. We usually do the first Monday of the month, but because of Election Day, we decided to do the second month, and this was a good uh, connection with Veterans Day and the Vietnam War. Um, the Manuscript Society is a nonprofit dedicated to collecting, researching, and preserving manuscripts and collections. Membership is open to everyone, including collectors, scholars, dealers, and the general public. Uh, we offer scholarship support to graduate students through the Richard Mass Research Grant. Grant. Uh, the URL for more information about the Manuscript Society is right there. The Manuscript Society is, uh, encourages the collection and preservation of manuscripts and documents, stimulates and aids collection, collectors in their various collecting specialties, facilitates the exchange of information and knowledge among collectors, scholars, and dealers, and promotes the highest professional and eth ethical standards. When it was founded, um, it was primarily an organization in North America and Canada, but has now become international and has members in Asia, Australia, Europe, North America, and South America. It publishes a, a quarterly journal titled Manuscripts and a quarterly newsletter, the Manuscript Society News. Also publishes books from time to time. Uh, it includes its scholarship program, as I mentioned. And on the lighter side, we have an annual meeting which offers members a fun-filled get-together and visits to memorable manuscript venues both in the United States and abroad. We've uh, visited major cities like Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Washington, and Boston. Last year, we were in San Antonio. And the 2025 annual meeting will be held in New York City. Um, we're very excited to have Stuart Lutz with us um, for this Manuscript Mondays. Stuart Lutz has been in the historic document and manuscript field for over 30 years. During that time, he has sold the autographs and letters of all the presidents, prominent Civil War and Revolutionary War figures, signers of the Declaration of Independence, famous authors, well-known businessmen, important aviators and scientists, distinguished African-Americans, and notable women. He also specializes in correspondence with outstanding content, and by ordinary people, such as a letter written from the Oregon Trail, Civil War battles, battle letters written by soldiers, or a letter written from Honolulu after, after Pearl Harbor. Stewart is a member of the Professional Autograph Dealers Association, the Manuscript Society, the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America, and the Ephemeral Society. He is also a certified member of the Appraisers Association of America, qualified in historic documents, and he was the subject of a Time Magazine article on his appraisal of their extensive archive. So without further ado, we welcome Stuart Lutz here tonight, and he will be discussing his uh, material culture of the Vietnam War and his collecting in that area. Thank you, Stuart, for being here with us. Thank you, Jay and Lee. I appreciate it. And uh, I hope everybody had a uh, good Veterans Day. I hope if there are any veterans out there, you had a meaningful Veterans Day. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to go through about 15 manuscripts from my collection and talk about how they illustrate the era of the Vietnam War. Uh, here on this slide, you can see that I did the uh, text in color because it's certainly a colorful era. Uh, just a little bit about me. I'm in New Jersey. I've been collecting artifacts from the American War in Vietnam for about 20 years now. Everything I'm going to show you is from my archive, and it was quite a challenge to uh, boil everything down to just 15 items. Uh, I believe that the Vietnam War was the most important and influential event in American history from 1950 to 2000. Uh, there are ongoing political, military, and diplomatic issues uh, that still go on today. There are many historical lessons to be learned from the conflict. And one of the interesting parts is it was kind of the ugly war. So it's hard for me. One of the challenges is rescuing materials before they're tossed out 
even last month, uh, the son of a prominent uh, author about the Vietnam War and veteran told me either his archive is going in the trash or you can have it. And he came up and gave me seven tubs of his father's archive. So that, again, is part of the challenge. So anytime I talk about it, I always remember these are the 20 American servicemen who were killed in Southeast Asia on the day I was born in 1970. I do this so they are not forgotten. So the first manuscript I want to talk about here is in 1946, Ho Chi Minh wrote to an American officer offering to greet him and allow him to meet the former emperor of Vietnam, Bo Dai. Ho Chi Minh was uh, literate in English, as you can see from this. He actually spent some time in Boston when he was young. And just a quick chronology was Vietnam was known as French Indochina because the French had it for decades. During World War II, the French gave it up. The Japanese came in. When World War II ended in 1945, Japanese went out. The French came back in. So this letter is from early 1946, in which Ho Chi Minh is trying to curry some favor with an American military officer in the hopes that they can get the French out for once and for all from uh, Vietnam. If there ever was a time that the war could have been averted, it was probably here. Uh, American power is at its height. The French country was devastated by World War II, and the Americans probably could have told the French, you know what, you guys are done with Southeast Asia. But they did not do that, probably in part because Ho Chi Minh was communist and the Cold War was on. So as chronology of the war, in May 1954, the French surrendered at Dien Bien Phu to the Viet Minh. This is a famous paint, a picture of the uh, Viet Minh raising the flag over Dien Bien Phu. Shortly thereafter, as the French left, they told the Americans, don't get involved, it's not worth it, which went in one ear and out the other ear. How do I know this? I'll show you in a minute, but this is the earliest piece of anti-American anti-Vietnam War material I have ever seen. This was done in the summer of 1954, so just months after uh, the French surrender to Dien Bien Phu. So here uh, he talks about, on the left side, prevent American boys from dying in Indochina. Uh, I mean, I have hundreds of posters, leaflets, opposing the war, generally done in the 60s and 70s. But this one done in 1954 is the absolute earliest one I have. I've never seen anything earlier. So this is kind of an important piece in my collection. So in November 1954, the Attorney General Brownell wrote a memo to Eisenhower, which is shown on the left. He, the Attorney General talked about General Lawson Collins going to South Vietnam. All the handwriting on there, which I transcribe on the right, is in Eisenhower's handwriting. So essentially, he approved of the general going over there and being made a uh, ambassador, not so much uh, military. But this is essentially the document that started the Vietnam War. Again, the French told the Americans, don't get involved just a couple months later and hear Eisenhower sending over a general um, to uh, uh, have civilian assistance. If we fast forward a few years to 1962, there are very few Kennedy letters about Vietnam. They're very hard to find. As I've frequently said in my lectures about Vietnam, in 1962, if you had thought the communist country, which communist country would cause the Americans the most problem in the 1960s, I think 99 out of 100 Americans would have guessed Cuba, not Vietnam. So this is a letter from JFK as president. A uh, captain had sent him a book about guerrilla war. And 
I do think that this was Kennedy was certainly thinking about Vietnam at this time. And here he read the book and was talking about the ratio of forces in a guerrilla war. So this is a very rare piece uh, from JFK with uh, a Vietnam mention, even if it's a little bit indirect. So in August 1964, the USS Maddox was attacked in the Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, and I say attacked in quotes. There's debate about what happened. Using that, uh, LBJ ran through Congress the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which enabled the uh, president conduct, to conduct unlimited warfare on North Vietnam. The bill was signed on August 10th, 1964, the same date as this letter. This letter is signed by Senator Pat McNamara of Michigan, not to be confused with Defense Secretary Robert McNamara. And here he's defending his vote in favor of the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. He hopes that it will prevent an escalation of the war in Vietnam. It will contribute to the peace and security of Southeast Asia. So this is a very timely letter as we start to expand our presence in Southeast Asia. Part of my collection is not just the great people of the war, but also the soldiers and servicemen and servicewomen who were over there. So this is a letter from January 17th, 1966 from a Marine talking about an unwitting suicide bomber. They talk about that the Viet Cong tied a bomb around a nine-year-old girl who was friendly with the Marines, who brought them drinks. And um, she uh, went up to them and they detonated the bomb and killed four Marines on that day. So this is sort of talking about the escalation of the war. This obviously occurred in South Vietnam. So um, this is a letter from a soldier. It's also remarkable how detailed he is. I generally find that letters, uh, especially ones home, are, don't worry about me, mom, that's okay, as opposed to the few diaries I have that are very detailed. Here I start to, start to show the split in the country over the war. So this is a Bob Hope letter in 1966. He was famous for entertaining the troops. So this 1966 letter, he went over there and um, he said that his 1964 trip was rewarding, but the one in 1966 was even better. Now, what's interesting is he starts to take a pro-war stance and that people here in the States know what our boys are doing. And they certainly can't make us forget the draft card burners and the anti-Vietnam marchers. So he sort of takes a pot shot at the uh, anti-war movement that's starting to build in the country. So there were no talks between North Vietnam and the United States for many years. The impetus for talks was in January 1968 was the Tet Offensive, which um, was a devastating loss to the Vietnam, the North Vietnamese, but it was a uh, loss of prestige for the Americans who've been, the American military have been saying, light at the end of the tunnel and everything else. So in May 1968, the parties, the Americans, the South Vietnamese and the North Vietnamese decided to meet in Paris and have some peace talks. So the main American negotiator was Philip Habib. This is his admission card to the Paris peace talks. I bought a whole lot of his papers from his family, including appointments by LBJ and such. What's kind of interesting about this is the number on it, number 0003. I would suspect that the North Vietnamese probably had number one, the South Vietnamese had number two, and Habib here had number three. Um, so this shows a start of the talks between the warring parties in the hopes that something would come together, although it took essentially another five years until that happened. So this is a soldier's carry through the jungle diary from 1968. 
if you look on the left side, he talks about he got mortared again. And on the right side, they searched the village and they got hit by Claymore mines and AK-47 fire from the North Vietnamese. Now, diaries from Viet letters from Vietnam are common. The people would write home dozens and dozens of letters, generally on paper, but I also have audio tape letters where they're little cassettes that the family can pop into their tape player and listen to their soldier. Diaries are much rarer. A, they were discouraged by the military because uh, they did not want the soldier to be killed and then have the diary picked off of them and then maybe some military intelligence in there. Uh, also, it was very wet and rainy in Vietnam, so it was not really conducive for carrying a diary. In all my years of collecting, I have three diaries. Uh, not only did I purchase this diary, but I also got the man's Purple Heart. He was also awarded the Silver Star. However, when I bought the collection, the Silver Star was missing, unfortunately. Again, this shows the way that the average American serviceman was dealing um, with Vietnam. 1968 was the height of the war. We had 550,000 troops there and about 16,000 Americans were killed during that calendar year. This is a draft card for uh, a man named Mark Mock in 1969. Surprisingly, these are kind of difficult to find on the in the marketplace because a lot of people who served in Vietnam are still alive and they pretty much all kept them. Um, so these are kind of difficult to find, but I just wanted to show this to show that this is a manuscript about somebody getting called up to uh, serve in the army during Vietnam. One thing that's unusual about the war, most people don't realize, is the majority of servicemen in Southeast Asia were not drafted, they enlisted. And this surprises people. The reason for that is if you knew you were gonna get drafted, you were also able to enlist to avoid that. So for example, the young lady who works for me, her dad enlisted in the Navy because he'd rather be on a ship offshore than walking through rice paddies and getting hit by mines. My auto mechanic loved to fly he saw the writing on the wall, so he enlisted in the Air Force. So the majority of American servicemen over there actually volunteered and enlisted to go there. They were not drafted. This is a really rare piece. So POW Richard Brenneman was a aviator. He was shot down, I believe, in 1967 and thrown into the infamous Hanoi Hilton. After Ho Chi Minh died in 1969, the North Vietnamese decided to lighten up slightly on the treatment of the POWs. So for Christmas 1969, the soldiers were allowed to write home one letter to their families. This is his one and only communication that he had with his family from 1967 until he was released in early 1973. There's no stamp on it. The reason for that is the Red Cross came to North Vietnam, collected all of them, and then distributed them across the United States. I've never seen another letter from somebody who was a POW in the Hanoi Hilton. So if I had to pick one of the most emotional pieces in my collection, it's this. It's, you know, it's the size of a postcard. But it just says so much and his hopes that eventually he's going to get home. It's Christmas. He still has another two and a half years until he gets out of there. Um, actually, three and a half years until he gets out of there. So this is really one of the most illustrative and emotional pieces in my collection. So this is a letter from William Calley while he was on trial for the My Lai Massacre. Uh, it was not widely reported at first, but Lieutenant Kelly died earlier this year. Um, he was convicted of the his participation in the My Lai Massacre, which killed somewhere on the order of four to 500 women and children in uh, Vietnam. So while he was on trial, a Florida motel owner invited him when the trial's over, I'd like you to come stay with us. 
So this is his response, and he says that he hopes someday he'll have the chance to visit. Um, so this was done during a very contentious trial during the war in Fort Benning. I have many, many anti-war pieces in my collection. It is much more difficult to find pro-war materials. These are two posters for the March for Victory Parade in Washington on April 4th, 1970. It was the largest pro-war protest of the entire war. Uh, there were several anti-war protests that were very large in 1969 in Washington. This was the response. So these are two posters advertising um, the war. I'm not sure if they were carried that day or just posters that were put in windows advertising it. But uh, pro-war material is much harder to find. So this is a letter, February 20th, 1973, as the war ended, to Henry Cabot Lodge. Now, Henry Cabot Lodge was Nixon's running mate in 1960 when he lost to JFK, and he was later ambassador to South Vietnam. So this is a letter to him, Nixon's reaction when he went to Clark Field to greet the POWs returning. Some of them had been... Uh, there in Hanoi for up to nine years. Uh, but this is uh, Richard Nixon's letter to Henry Cabot Lodge talking about these brave men were able to return to a nation which had achieved peace with honor. Uh, again, one of the very nebulous things about the Vietnam War and the history is a question of did we win? And here Nixon does not say that we had won, but we had achieved Peace with honor. So on his first full day in office in 1977, Jimmy Carter signed a draft dodger pardon, um, allowing people who had skipped the draft and such uh, had pardoned them for their actions of that time. So this is a contemporary copy of the uh, original, the government has the original. I have never seen another one. Uh, what had happened for years, I tried to get President Carter to sign one. I used to write to him at his Carter Library and such, and I always got back emails or letters saying, President Carter will only sign photographs of himself or books that he's in. And about eight years ago, I was reading the Washington Post and they had an article on how little it cost the government for Secret Service and other uh, amenities for President Carter in plane. So I thought, hmm, I wonder if he's listed in the phone book. And sure enough, he's, his address is listed in the phone book. So I wrote a little letter to President Carter and I included this in there and I told him what I was doing. And I said, if you sign it, I'll be happy to make a donation to the Carter Center. And about two months later, uh, he was well into his 90s I got in the mail uh, this. He also signed in full. He did not sign Jay Carter, which is his usual thing these days. Uh, he signed in full. I've never seen another one. So I suspect this is the only other copy of the draft Dodger pardon uh, in existence. Now, uh, the next letter I'm going to show you talks about the aftermath of the Vietnam War. So this is a letter from 1984 from Dean Rusk, who was Secretary of State in the 60s. And there's a lot of blame and argument in the decades after the Vietnam War about what happened. So here's a letter from Dean Rusk when he was in Georgia, stating that he thought it was the anti-war protesters uh, who were to blame for the uh, loss in Vietnam. And he said that just hang in there, and you can win politically what you cannot win militarily. Now, I have several other letters from the 80s from prominent people, such as General Westmoreland and such, in which they're debating the reasons for the war and the causes of the war and such. Uh, so I just wanted to illustrate that what a hot uh, wire Vietnam remained. Here we are 10 years after the war. I do remember when I was in college, I read a uh, 
Civil War book, I think it was by Kenneth Stamp, the famous historian, who joked that uh, as belligerent as the Union and Confederate generals were, even more belligerent were the Civil War historians. So this sort of reminds me of how there was just as much fighting about the meaning of the war afterwards. And the last piece I'm going to end with is my dream piece. Uh, this is a piece I would love to find. I cannot imagine that there are a lot of them in existence. Maybe one day some someone will call me with it or it'll turn up. So this is in French. It was distributed in 1919 by this man who signed at the bottom, Nien I Kwok. And I don't know if that's a correct pronunciation, but I'm trying. So this man, Nien, went to Paris uh, for the Treaty of Versailles, and he distributed this leaflet, and he was hoping that the Americans would pressure the French to get out of uh, French Indochina. This copy is the one from Secretary of State Lansing, who was Wilson's Secretary of State. Uh, it was shown at a... National Archives exhibit maybe about eight years ago at the National Archives in D.C., in which they only had materials from the National Archives to illustrate the Vietnam War. So the interesting part about it is the signer at the bottom, Nien I Quoc, which means Nien the Patriot, we don't really know the name now because he later changed his name to Ho Chi Minh. So Ho Chi Minh was at the Treaty of Versailles passing out these leaflets to all the uh, delegates from France and England and the U.S. and all in the hopes that his people could be freed from French domination. So this is the dream piece. I would love to find one because essentially this would sort of be square one of a Vietnam collection, Ho Chi Minh in 1919, realizing it's time for the French to go. So that sort of ends the slideshow. Um, so it was about 15 documents from it. Um, happy to take questions. And uh, that's really about it. So. Thank you, Stuart. That was wonderful. A really amazing collection. Really Thanks. See it. Uh, here are some, here's a, a couple questions for you to start off with. Um, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat or put it in the Q&A. But uh, how long have you been collecting in the Vietnam War and why the Vietnam War? Uh, two questions. So I've probably been seriously collecting since I went into business around 2000 or so. I would go to paper shows and antique shows and I would occasionally find things. And I so that's sort of when I collected. Uh, if my mother is on the uh, call, uh, she will start yelling because she bought me some Vietnam War pins back in the early 90s when I was in college and when I had an interest in it. So that was kind of the genesis, but it took maybe about 10 years for me to really get started. Um, as for why, uh, several reasons. One, the great Vietnam War collection has never been put together yet, um, as far as I'm concerned. So that's one aspect. Two, if I was growing up, when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, Vietnam was kind of a hangover. We were going through this really weird period. I recall maybe it was about nine or 10 when the U.S. tried to rescue the hostages and failed in, um, in Iran that the newscast said, you know, first, you know, we can't beat, beat the Vietnamese and then the Arabs turn off the oil. Now we can't even rescue our hostages. So sort of it was what I grew up with. So there was a great interest in that. Um, and again, I really think it was a um, highly influential event. And by the way, if you here's the example I give when I speak before veterans groups, my nephew, who's a retired Marine officer, served four or five tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. Why did he serve that many tours? Because we don't have a draft. Why do we not have a draft? Because they got rid of it in 1973 after the end of the Vietnam War. So that's how the war continues to influence us today. So next question. What what part of the Vietnam War that you don't don't you collect? 
the only things I really don't collect are uniforms because I don't have a place to store them and I would have no idea what is genuine and what isn't. I don't collect helmets for storage reasons and I do not collect weapons. Um, but other than that, it's leaflets, books, letters, diaries, posters, you name it. So, uh, here's a letter, uh, a question from Brad Cook, who edits our manuscripts magazine. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the diaries you showed are in really amazing condition, haven't been through the jungles and rain. Did you by any chance learn from the owner how he took care of them so well? Uh, thanks, Brad. Um, Actually, I showed the pages that are not water stained on purpose uh, to make them a little bit more legible. The guy who kept them was in West Virginia. He died about 1985, a paper picker, maybe about eight years ago, knew what I collected and he contacted me and that's how I acquired them. Uh, I do know the gentleman's name, but there's not a lot of information on him. his obituary was kind of scarce. So. Um, have you acquired any of the audio tapes recorded by the soldiers? Uh, yeah, somewhere I have a whole box of audio tapes uh, that I bought on eBay a number of years ago. I just thought it was kind of cool. Plus, if I do a display or anything like that, everybody thinks letters are handwritten and such. And then I go in and show there was another way to transmit letters back to families and they recorded materials. So uh, here's another way that, uh, you know, soldiers stayed in touch with their families. So are you converting those audio tapes to digital? Uh, no, I haven't. I haven't even listened to them, nor do I know how to uh, do that. Although there's somebody local who has, I bought some, several films from, I actually bought a film of a Washington DC mall protest from a dealer and this local store converted the film to digital. Maybe I'll see if they also have the ability to convert audio uh, from these tapes to uh, digital. So good point. Okay. And uh, regarding the tubs that you just received, how long do you think it'll take you to get get through them uh i don't know maybe over christmas break i'll start looking through them or such like in any archive there's going to be a lot of detritus that may not be that interesting and such so uh i'm kind of looking for the good material the photographs um and if there's a book draft in there or any correspondence about his book i'll certainly keep that uh if i can say one other thing about photographs um, 90% of the photographs from the Vietnam War are generally taken on base and kind of mundane. Uh, staying on base was nice and safe. Uh, I have lots of photographs of shot up tanks and helicopters missing parts of their tail rotor and that type of stuff. The photographs that are harder to find are the combat photographs, the ones in the field or the street scenes where, uh, uh, American soldier went out in Saigon and took photographs or photographs when the guy was in the helicopter um, and uh, just sticking out the side of the helicopter and taking photographs of the landscape. I will also say I also digitize a lot of the photographs and the amazing colors of vector chrome and Kodachrome 60 years after they're taken is unsurpassed. They are amazing photographs in terms of their color and the richness of them, far better than most digital photographs of today. So, uh, let me see here. What other questions do we have? Um, uh, is it true that uh, Ho Chi Minh wrote President Truman in hopes of American support to oust the French? Uh, yeah, I believe the National Archives somewhere has a letter. Uh, from Ho Chi Minh to President Truman, uh, hoping to liberate his country from France. And again, with that Ho Chi Minh letter from 1946, America had the military and economic power to tell France, you know, it, it's time to decolonize, but they did not do that. So, um, 
Barton, do you want to say a few words about your service? Now, I just turned the audio on. Is that okay? Yeah, yep, we, we hear, you. hear you. Okay. Uh, I was I was in the medical corps in uh, uh, just finished my med finished my medical training in 1968 and was in the was at in the, went in the army um, and was at Fort Benning from 68 to 70 at the, the height of the war, obviously. And I, I just like to comment. Uh, I first of all congratulate Stuart on this keeping this stuff is is the the, the, the really. What what makes the manuscript society worthwhile and 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 his collection uh, is really it's really great that that he has this this stuff. But the the thing that that, that I got in my service Fort Benning was uh, the, the 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 headquarters for the infantry training. There were fifty thousand troops there, uh, so it was it was it was a huge uh, huge uh, organization. And of course, there were a lot of officers and enlisted men who had returned from service in Vietnam. And the overwhelming feeling, uh, th their feeling was of great disappointment in the way their service was perceived and the way the progress of the war was perceived. The, the press did what they are still doing to this day. They did not just report the news, but they slanted it. And this is something I had a journalism course, amazing journalism course with our local newspaper when I was in high school. And, and the press did not do that in the 1950s. They reported the news, but the, it was slanted. The local newspaper in Columbus, Georgia, had a correspondent who was in Vietnam a lot of the time, and they, they reported the news as it happened. But the, the, the servicemen were very bitter about the way things were reported and, and, and the way their service was perceived by the public after they, after they came back. Uh, I just mentioned in particular the Tet Offensive. The, the, the press reported, gave the slant such that, that the Tet Offensive was, views, was viewed as a great defeat for, for the South Vietnamese and the Americans. But in point of fact, it, it was a disaster for the North Vietnamese. It was a slaughter. They 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 chained their people in the tanks and and the and the and the, and the machines. They sent them they sent them for slaughter, and and it was it was a, a disaster. I have no reason to disbelieve what what the the uh, the, the men who were there. I, I was at the Fort Benning for the whole for my whole service. I didn't go to Vietnam, um, but but in any case, that that was that was the perception we got. From the ground, uh, from the ground in in um, at, at Fort Benning at, during that war, and uh, unfortunately at that time I was not, <laughs> I was not into autographs, and and I I should have I should have I could have collected some wonderful things uh, 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 related to the history of the war, but the, the, then on a on a personal note, the thing that got me was the scenes that happened when the United States abandoned Vietnam. And the scenes of all those people trying to be rescued by by us. I mean, the scenes were the the, the scenes on the news were devastating, and it, it really apparently it made no impression. But that that was my my experience being in the army, and and my my, my two years on a personal level were very rewarding because we we had we had a, a big Martin Army Hospital at Fort Benning, and and we had. All kinds of of I was an internist, so we had all sorts of infectious, crazy infectious disease and stuff that came back with the troops from Vietnam. So it was a it was a, it was a great experience for me on a medical level. And the thing the thing that I must say, uh, uh, I was impressed with the way the the army was run. Now. I must admit that it was during the war, and of course they got everything they asked for, uh, the army. But but they really, it really was a wonderful organization. They they did the job the way it should have been done, and and um, it, it was a great experience for me. So I, I felt privileged, and and I did feel sorry for the for the attitude 
that, that greeted the, the, our veterans in those days. That's it. Thanks, Barton. Thanks. Thanks for your service. Um, here's a question. The Captain Ferris that Ho Chi Minh wrote to, was he a member of the OSS? Who was he? I don't know. I, I need to research that more. Uh, it was a lot of three letters at auction. I could only buy one of them, but I bought what I thought was most interesting with the mention of the Emperor Bo Dai. But uh, I, I'll, I'll do some research on that. So it's a good question. What is the oddest item you have come across? Ooh. Uh, uh. Let me know who's asking that. I'll have to think about it. Um, Brad Cook. Brad. All right, Brad. I'm going to think of something. Um, I, I don't know. But, I mean, I have some, I had something meaningful. I go to the Allentown Paper Show and next to it is a giant building with all types of food that you can imagine. And in there is a man who there's a Vietnamese restaurant. And I sort of befriended the man and he got out in April 75. And he told me once, come back tomorrow. I have something for you. And he brought some Vietnamese currency with him when he left 50 years ago. And he gave me a note. So that sort of touched me that he he gave me something that was that personal for him that is a remembrance of his country. So, but I'll have to think of the odd one. So. Okay. And uh, where do you find a lot of this material? Um, eBay is pretty good. Um, but a lot of my fellow dealers know I collect this stuff. So they send me heads up or they send me emails. Um, I'll find stuff on abe.com or uh, Biblio. Uh, but again, I've had people give me stuff. There's a woman here in New Jersey whose husband was <laughs> a Vietnam veteran against the war. He was a reverend and he died a couple years ago and she contacted me and I'm still waiting for it, but she's there. I have all this stuff. We don't have kids. You can have it. So, um, I'm kind of touched with that. So, um, how do you organize the material so you can find it? Not well. Uh, I have all the best stuff in a few notebooks that are in safes, but it sort of gets tossed on a shelf and every once in a while my son organizes it, um, or I probably need somebody else to come in and start scanning and organizing. I also have a crazy little deal with Getty Images where I license usage rights. And so my material appears in New York Times and CNN and such. So I digitize a lot of the posters and photographs and letters and such, and then they, and pins especially. And then, so if CNN does something on famous political pins, I'll get something in there that way. So I try to digitize them that way, but it's kind of the sources apprentice, much more comes in than I can possibly organize or digitize, so. Okay. And uh, have you decided on the eventual disposition of this very important collection? Uh, I've had several major institutions tell me when the time comes, let them know. But uh, that's probably 20 years off. So, And you continue to collect? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, it's kind of like, it's not like collecting all the Herman Millville first editions. It's just infinite. There's every college printed something. Um I gave a talk at the New Jersey Vietnam Veterans Memorial two weeks ago, and Vietnam was the first bumper sticker war. So they're bumper stickers to collect. And it was also the first war done after the invention of photocopying. So it was really easy at whatever university, people <laughs> to write up a poster, put on the copier, and then run off 100 copies. So it was much easier than that technology was not around during world war two or Korea or something. So there's a lot more paper and ephemera on this war. So. Um, anybody else have any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Stuart. Appreciate the talk. Oh, here's another question from Bob Harper, Bob Harper. Hopper. Yep. 
Uh, let me see here. What do you say? Have you collected material from foreign service and aid officers who served in the field? Uh, I probably have something. Um, most of the stuff that came back was soldier related, soldier photographs and soldier letters and that type of stuff. Um, again, I bought the Habib collection, who was a diplomat over there. Um, and such. So, uh, probably not enough. I probably, and the other thing I would love to get is more service woman material, the nurses over there and that type of stuff. Uh, I have very, very little of it. So I would like to round out the collection with that. So do you make the materials available for researchers? Um, yeah, the New York historical society did a Vietnam exhibit pre COVID. So their two curators came over here uh ken burns when he did his vietnam doctor documentary i spoke to him on the phone and i lent them a number of photographs from a early american officer there in the early 60s and they digitized everything and then ken's assistant told me it was quote too gruesome for public television which kind of surprised me because when i was watching the vietnam series which was like 18 hours they showed pictures of uh, the Viet Cong had decapitated people and put their heads on spikes. And they showed photographs of Diem and his brother after their November 1963 assassination. So there was plenty of gruesome stuff on television. So it was, I was kind of surprised that uh, Ken uh, rejected my materials. So, but that happens. So, well, thank you for attending, everybody. And uh, all right, thanks. Thank you, Stuart. The next Manuscripts Monday is going to be held December 2nd, Monday, December 2nd. We don't have a speaker, but Brian Kathanis will be uh, hosting, and it, it'll be people interested in collecting and selling and all that stuff. People can just join and um, ask questions and just get ready for the holidays. Um, and then in January, we have Joel Silver uh, from Indiana University will be here for the Lilly Library. If you have any ideas for future uh, Manuscript Mondays, please reach out to me and let me know. But thank you, everybody. I appreciate everybody joining tonight. And uh, thank you very much, Stuart, for your time. Thanks again.